when you got to go to a Yankees game, it didn't matter what time of year it was, it was just electric. The anticipation, the animosity, the excitement, nothing like Yankee Red Sox. That's the best rivalry in baseball. From a lot of Red Sox fans, I think you have to go to New York to win a World Series. American League Championship Series over. Yankees win! The Yankees-Red Sox rivalry is the most exciting portion of my career that I get to visit year after year after year. Get He's being restrained. Both benches have emptied. You know you're working the Red Sox and the Yankees. It's never been an easy battle. It's some of the best battles ever. It was a playoff game every, every time we played them. You have to go through those miserable times in sports and the struggles to enjoy the good times. The Boston Red Sox and the New York Yankees. For more than eight decades, the greatest rivalry in sports wasn't much of a rivalry at all. Since Boston last captured a World Series in 1918, and their best player, Babe Ruth, had switched sides, their heated and hated foes from New York had raised 26 championship banners. Two thousand three looked to be the year the curse may be reversed. The Red Sox led the Yankees late in Game Seven of the American League Championship Series. They were just five outs from the team's first pennant since 1986. There was nothing like walking out the field Game Seven uh, when Aaron Boone hit that home run. Devastating. Tears. All your emotions. But I think the group of guys that we had, you know, 80% of us, it was the same team going in 2004. We kind of took the loss as uh, kind of a motivating factor. 2003 was a, a bit of momentum for us. I mean, the team was still hungry. We were so close. The year before, we felt like we had the best team around, uh, but we also knew adding a closer uh, was going to help. Adding Kurt Schilling was going to help. I think in the bigger picture for, for all of us that stayed and knew what we had, it was um, you know, very motivating that following year to come back and, and fulfill you know, uh, a bigger destiny for us. Knowing how far we had gone in 2003 and how close we had come, we just kind of looked at each other and said, you know, as far as we went that year, you know, let's see if we can go even farther in 2004. When you looked at where they ended 2003 and what they did to make the team better in 2004, you, you knew that the potential was there. Um, then at that point, though, you're still fighting history, you're talking about the curse, and you, you've got all this talent that's rolled through Boston year after year, decade after decade, and you think, when's it finally going to break through? When's this finally going to happen? With a few key newcomers added to a motivated core, oh, good with your head. Perfect. the Red Sox roster was geared to finally break the curse. There was also an off-the-field idea aimed at reversing the team's luck. Bring back Tessie. Broadway musical ballad was used by the Royal Rooters, the team's loyal fans, to taunt opponents during the first World Series in 1903. This time we're going to sing Boston instead of Tessie. We recorded the song right across the street, and um, you know we had a few of the players come over, Bronson Arroyo, Johnny Damon. And it was just like a little bit of a buzz starting to build on this thing. Man could not be wrong. You know, the fans stopped singing the song when Ruth was traded. Hence, 86 years without winning a World Series. So, 
I started to buy into the storyline and I was telling everybody that would listen. But I was like, I guarantee a World Series. To get there, however, the Red Sox would need to finally find a way to vault past their storied rivals. They would need a turning point. On the morning of July 23, 2004, the Red Sox were 52 and 43, a respectable nine games over 500, but still eight and a half games behind the New York Yankees. The first place foes arrived in Boston for the first of three at Fenway and captured Friday night's series opener after plating the winning run in the ninth inning off closer Keith Folk. And New York takes game one of this three game series. Eight to seven, their lead now nine and a half games over the Red Sox in the American League East. The Sox were set to send number five starter Bronson Arroyo to the mound on Saturday. The game was scheduled to begin at 315, but overnight rain had blanketed Fenway's old field. On that Saturday morning, uh, all four umpires had been looking at the weather because outside it was absolutely horrible. Uh, the intensity and, and the amount of rain that was coming down. And when we got in our car ride to, the, uh, to Fenway, uh, the four of us were in agreement that it stood a good chance that you know, we weren't going to play. With the old field, we would actually use drying agent on the grass also because we couldn't get the surface to dry. We would bring in helicopters that would have 175 mile an hour downdraft if it flew you know, six to 10 feet off the ground and help basically try to dry the surface. So it was amazing all the things we would do on the old field to get it ready. And certainly that morning uh, was another day where the field uh, was soft on the top and not handling the rain well. We get undressed and put our uh, sweatshirt on and everything and then uh, the clubhouse guy brought the weather people in, meaning the ground screw and they told us the outlook was extremely poor and, you know, we just have to ride it out. I mean, everybody was up in the press box just watching the time tick away and wondering if, if this game was going to start. You know, we were there to do it on national television. A little after one o'clock, there was, there was a, a lightening up of the rain and everything else. And so, I don't know if it was they were going to make a decision at that time or whatever, but I took the crew, the entire crew, we went down the left field line, came out where the scoreboard is, and we went to left center field. I remember there was discussions, can the field get, get playable? You know, safety and playability is everyone's first priority, and we want to get the game in if we can, but it's got to be safe. And there were places out there where there was standing water, and how long would it take the field to drain? and what could we do to get it in. The discussion was whether we were going to play or not, and we'd have another meeting in an hour to see what we were going to do. Elsewhere inside Fenway Park, Ken Casey and the Dropkick Murphys were preparing to perform Tessie live for the first time before the game. It started to be a room, I was like, that might not be a game. And it's like, oh, that's, that, that definitely, uh, you know, for a band waiting for that opportunity. And like I said, for us, it, you have to understand, like, this wasn't like a cross promotional marketing idea. It was like, we were like legit fans, you know what I mean? So we were like kids in the candy store, just the opportunity to do this. And the thought that it might not happen was definitely a little uh, of a bummer. An hour after the first meeting, crew chief Bruce Fremming made a second trip to Fenway's outfield. It's still raining. The, the rain is incredible yet. And I believe this is, the decision telling time because it certainly doesn't look like we can play ball. The weather's too bad. We're going to call a game. And this is, and, and I can't give you the exact time, but this, it's after 2.30 and they wanted to tell the press. So he said, can you give us 15 minutes before you call the game? And I said, absolutely. I remember the Yankees we're told and we got word from down below that they were getting dressed, that they were getting out of their uniform, into their, uh, into their street clothes and going to the bus 
And so that was the indication that, well, we may not know officially that this game has been called off, but it sure seems like it has been. Fremming and his crew were still in the umpire's dressing room when the phone rang. Terry Francona said, Bruce, there's been a change in plans. And I said, are you in the clubhouse with some club people? He said, that would be right. You know, you had just kind of a bunch of guys just like, what? We're not gonna play, no, no, we're gonna go play. So, you know, Veritek and whoever it was had the idea of going to Frank Cohn's office. We believed in Bronson Roy. He's very underrated on our team. He was our fifth starter. He was our guy. And we told him we're playing. That was uh, hands down the strangest, probably the strangest day of my big league career. We were kind of on a, on a downhill slide. The Yankees were beating us up a little bit. And I remember there was a couple of guys, Millar was definitely one of them, who they wanted to play the game because Kevin Brown was hurt and wasn't going to be pitching that game. And I think we were facing Canyon Sturts instead. And so there was this whole kind of gang of veteran guys, and this wouldn't happen on very many teams. But these guys commanded so much respect um, in that locker room that they could walk into management and say, listen, we need to play this game no matter what. We need to find a way, and we're not going to cancel this thing. We weren't afraid of the Yankees. I mean, we knew they were a very good team, but because we were struggling, we didn't feel like you know, we should cancel the game. So what, it's a little cold, a little damp. The captain was in charge. He he wanted to uh, get the game going. Well, I think that it was it was a collective. It was we knew what was in front of us. We knew what we had going. We knew what they had available to pitch, and we felt like it was an opportunity for us to to start you know taking some ground back from them when we wanted to play. Our goal and job was to get the field ready, and so the team could to go out and play. Both teams could go out and play. And I certainly felt that passion from the Red Sox players. We went back in the dressing room and we dressed and uh, got ready for the game. They said game on in like 30 minutes. It was something so ridiculous. I was taking a nap. I mean, you need 30 minutes to get prepared if you're ready to walk out of the clubhouse door. And I was sleeping. So I woke up almost in a stone cold panic. I mean, the only thing I can compare it to, honestly, is like, you know, as a kid, you have these dreams of of going to school and you forgetting your clothes or something like that, just this full-on panic of, I'm pitching against the Yankees today and, and now they want me to go out there completely unprepared. And so I threw on my uniform as fast as I could. After a 54-minute rain delay, Bronson Arroyo was set to throw the first pitch at 4.09 p.m. At the time, no one knew what was about to unfold. Red Sox players got their way on July 24, 2004. Despite dire field conditions and the Yankees' assumption the game had officially been postponed, there would be baseball played that afternoon. A long rain delay and we were, we were ready to play and um, things happen on, uh, in the, during the course of battle, that's for sure. Before the game, the Dropkick Murphys debuted their remake of the Royal Rooters ballad, Tessie. We got the chance to play the song, and I'm telling everyone, this is it. Season turns around here. We're going to win a World Series and get back to the seat. And, uh, you know, it's just a blowout. <laughs> and I'm like, it's over before it started. Three balls, two strikes, and reaching for it is Rodriguez. Now getting to the bag is Arroyo safe. People that I had been telling, like friends and stuff, were like, yeah, how, how's that song working out? You're, you're the jinx and all the stuff. 3-2, runner goes, Posada with a base hit into center field, and Rodriguez will end up at third. The game started at 4.09, following an official 54-minute delay. It took the Yankees less time to grab a lead. Arroyo in trouble, first and third, nobody out. And Matsui into left center field. That's going to put the Yankees on top. One hop off the wall. In to score is Alex Rodriguez. They will hold Posada on an RBI double by Matsui. Um, I didn't get an opportunity to do half the things I normally would to prepare for a game. I'm down in the bullpen, I'm warming up, and I, you know, it's like it's game on. Adrenaline is absolutely spiked to the ceiling, and I'm out there in the middle of this game, and I, I'm not even loose. The Yankees were up three to nothing in the top of the third when Arroyo faced Alex Rodriguez. So here you are. You got Bronson Arroyo. He's 112 pounds, wet, six foot one, blonde hair, blue eyed, Cuban young man. Throws about 87 to 90, maybe max. One ball, one strike. 
Alex was a guy who you needed to beat on the inner half. And so I went in there twice. It was like an 87 mile an hour sinker and they hit him on the elbow pad. Alex Rodriguez is drilled and... If you don't dominate the inside corner, you're gonna get lit up, you know, day in and day out. And it was one of those, you know, let me show a little bit of my stripes and he kind of barked out to Bronson. Well, Veritech at that point said, hey, go ahead and take your butt down to first base. At first, um, I didn't feel like I had to react, first of all, because I thought it was an off-speed speed pitch. I didn't think there was intent there. You know, just part of, part of the game. You know, he felt he got hit. He was going after Bronson and, uh, and you know, yelling at Bronson, and I got in the middle of it. Simple. <laughs> it didn't do any damage, but I think he was irritated that he thought maybe there was some intent there. So he, he said, throw that over the plate. And I was just kind of slowly walking towards him and the umpire to get another ball and, and just kind of smiling, you know, and, and, and he said, throw that over the plate again. And after he said it the second time, then Veritech basically said something. I couldn't hear exactly what he was saying, but it was along the lines of, you know, just go down to first base and shut your mouth. You could see Alex saying a few things, but you couldn't see what, uh, see what, what Tech was saying. So I'm sure it wasn't uh, very pleasant, it wasn't very nice, and, and then it erupted into a wrestling match. Here we go. Veritek and A-Rod going at it. I think the second bad word that was said to Veritek, that's when we went glove to the face. Uh, you know, we saw what happened. Veritek tries to go up, picks him up with both legs. He only gets one. And I tried, if you look at the pictures, I tried to break it up with those two. Once, I couldn't do that. Once they went, uh, to, to swing at each other, uh, it was off, and we had we had 50 players and coaches on the field. Schilling is right in the middle of it. Now another fight off to the side. Millar is in it. Nixon is in it. Immediately, I'm really close to the fight, and I can remember thinking, I don't want to get into this fight. I want to let them two go one on one at it here for a minute. And then, you know, it's only a split second and then the dog pile is hitting. You know, you get that many big guys dancing around, it's, you know, you got to kind of head on the swivel, you got to kind of look out. Nothing against Alex, it was just baseball. It was, uh, you know, the Red Sox and Yankee rivalry. Something told me that Alex didn't know much about Veritech. You back a dog into a corner, you better be ready to fight. That's. The guy we always looked to when uh, we needed someone to speak up and do something, and uh, Jason was definitely there. We had Tanya Sturts, we had Trot Nixon, we had Gabe Kapler in the on deck circle. Now it becomes a, you know, this is a real fight. And I think that's what made our, our rivalries, you know, unique is that we fought a lot. Some things uh, tip people over the edge at times. And that might have been, you know, because of the series and because of the situation that caused Alex to uh, get pissed off. So now when that was all over and we, and the umpires got together again, now we're together again, because we had to take names and numbers. It was decided at that time that obviously Veritech and Rodriguez would be ejected. And that we, and because of the amount of fighting that was going on, we would pick two other players, one from each team, and have them ejected. When the dust settled, Jason Veritek and Gabe Kapler were tossed for the Red Sox. Alex Rodriguez and Kenny Lofton were gone for the Yankees. But more importantly, the Red Sox still trailed on the scoreboard, and the deficit would grow to five runs by the middle of the sixth inning. On July 24, 2004, the Red Sox clubhouse had convinced team officials to play. Their captain had confronted a Yankee All-Star. And the team had chipped away at New York's 9-4 sixth inning lead and trailed by just two heading into the ninth. Obviously a long, long, long day. A lot of runs being scored on both sides. And finally they take the lead. They have, you know, they're studying the game and Everybody knows what a, what a phenomenal job he's done over and over. Down 10 to eight, facing future Hall of Famer Mariano Rivera, Nomar Garcia Parra led off the bottom of the ninth with a double. The 0-2 pitch. 
Garcia Parra hits it to left center field. It's down for extra bases. Nomar came around to score on a one out Kevin Millar single. Bill Miller followed Millar, representing the winning run. You know, Billy had already had some success against Mariano, and uh, we just felt, I just felt like, like something good was going to happen. You can look into Billy's eyes like, you know what, he had a tremendous amount of confidence at that time. And you know, Mariano, he didn't really have that pinpoint accuracy in that at bat. And uh, all of a sudden, it was a 3-1 count. Three balls and a strike. And he, you know, throws one of his cutters, but it kind of like it grooved in there. Driven in the air to deep right field. I never assume it's gone just because, you know, when you're 5'10", about 185, you don't, you don't assume that balls are gone at all, ever. Back is Sheffield. The Red Sox win it. And when Billy hit it, you can look at Mariano's head, and he looks straight down and just want to kind of peek at the ball to say, you know, hopefully it's big enough in right field to hold it, but it wasn't. You know, you just uh, run your butt off and, and uh, you, uh, once it's over the wall, then, then you can slow down. Well, I was in the locker room, and there was a bunch of us in there because of the, the fight had really kind of stirred some stuff up. You know, when Billy Miller hits that home run, uh, I, I can remember it was the first time during the regular season that guys were so happy and jumping around inside the locker room, not just on the field for the win, almost as if it was a playoff game. As far as I was concerned that day, with that mess at the plate when the game ended, and we were there forever. He had the plate, the game was over, and it was an exciting day in our career. The Red Sox had come back to win 11 to 10 at Fenway. And while they had only gained a game on the first place Yankees, the events of July 24, 2004, were a turning point. When Bill hit that home run, and having Mo on the mound, um, you know, you finally see almost like this juggernaut finally has a, a chink in his armor. You know, it just seemed to give us a little bit of hope against uh, one of the greatest closers ever. You know, that was one of those games where you go back after the game that night and you think, it just feels different in the AL East and it feels like the Red Sox now have the upper hand. The Red Sox arrived at Fenway Park the morning of July 24, 2004, nine and a half games behind the Yankees in the American League East. Driven in the air to deep right field, back is Sheffield, the Red Sox win it! When they left late that night, they were only a game better, still eight and a half games out of first. But something had turned inside Fenway Park's home clubhouse. It was a game that helped turn around the season, helped us uh, get out of that 500 type of attitude and playing style. And, you know, we came together and we uh, uh, played very well. I think it's you, the hugest part, first thing that always comes to everybody's mind, I think, is chemistry. Um, you, have, you have a clubhouse that would go, go to war for each other, they would fight if need be. It was without question um, probably the biggest regular season game that we had had that season. And it kind of catapulted us to uh, for the last couple months. So um, you know, sometimes those things, even though you, you don't exactly look to, to get in a fight, it, it was something that we actually needed to kind of get us kickstarted. It definitely created some uh, momentum and I think uh, we took advantage of that day and, and we, we continued to build uh, as a team and, and continued to stay competitive. and and thought more of ourselves about uh, who we were and, and hoping that possibly, uh, you know, we're gonna be uh, a lot better in, in, in the end, September, October. It did kind of feel like there was a change uh, that day. And, and it felt like uh, a little bit of that power struggle that happens every year in the AL East swung toward the Boston Red Sox. And, and who knew what we had coming for us that October? On July 24th, 2004, no one could answer that question. But when history occurred a few months later, the impact that summer day had made was clear. And the Boston Red Sox are the world champions. We went 2-0 on that day. We, we, we won the fight. 
and we won the game. That was the turning point.